He's gonna interview from behind the camp. That would be me. And you get to, and you get to see. Now you can get to know me. Hard working. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like Kevin Hart, just behind the camera. Right. Y'all ready? Ready. Okay, so uh, I'm trying to hold my composure from behind the camera because it's very rare that you find two women who are so involved in stand-up comedy. We have Miss Sabrina Lott and the godmother of comedy, Miss Tina Brown. Uh, we'll start with Miss Sabrina. Tell us about, tell the people you are. And what you do? Well, first of all, I wouldn't be able to sit here if it wasn't for women like Tina Grant. So let's get that started first. So, like her story, I went to school to be a physician. And I got, I took my MCAT, did really well. And the same day, I got a ticket to go to New York for a job that I wanted in entertainment. So I spoke to my parents. I knew they were going to say no, but I wanted their blessing. And they said, go. I said, that, wow, okay. They said, you have the perfect fallback plan. Go to medical school. I said, okay. They said, go there, give it your all, and make it work. And so I did. Um, before I left to go to New York, I, was, I wanted to write. That's my passion. That's what I'm doing now is finding projects to write. And I met Rashawn McDonald, who opened up Hip Hop Comedy Stop. Um, Hip Hop Comedy Stop is a premier urban club. Uh, he partnered with Anthony Brown and Steve Harvey. So I was helping him promote the club. I would interview all the comedians, and um, I just fell in love with comedy. I fell in love with Rashawn because he became my one of my uncles and my big brothers. And through him and Steve, I got the good music because I didn't know the higher players and all that. But I would sit at their sets. I'd get all the great music, and then I'd get the com comedy with. Him. Uh, uncle Bernie, he truly became my Uncle Bernie and I miss him tremendously. Um, I, would, I went on tour with him for a couple of dates with Jamie Foxx and that is where I also met the legendary Paul Mooney. Um, Paul Mooney is always special to me because I was 20 something and I was a female and Rashawn was doing his deals in LA. Um, I think they had just done the deal for Steve to do uh, back, Boys Are Back or Back to the Boys or something, something with Nickelodeon. And um, he said, we got to go, and I need you to pick up Paul Mooney, take him on his radio runs, do not let him say the N-word, and come back and do the show. And I was like, huh? He said, I'm, yes, he said, I'm counting on you. So I got in the limo, I think my first time in the limo, and I fell in love with Paul Mooney. He told me all these stories about Richard Pryor and writing and Michael Jackson and all of that. And he, I just, I fell in love with him. And got to the radio station and I was able to say, now you cannot say the N word. And he went on the radio and he said, I've been told I cannot say the N word. But he didn't say it, so I, I did my job. Then I got back and Rashawn and them were leaving and I was like, where, where are you going? You have to run the show. You have to make sure everything is taken care of. And I freaked out. I was so precious. I didn't want to make a mistake because I didn't want Rashawn to be upset. And thank God I made it through. But he has been my mentor. He has been my eagle. He has been my support. When he knew I wanted to write and he left for LA, he would send me scripts from the Tian Tamara show, the twin show. He'd send me scripts from Moesha to show me how to format. And even to this day, so flip it even more so, I met up with J. Anthony Brown on a whim because I was working with my other musical brother, Christopher Williams. He was going to do the Tom Joyner Morning Show Cruise, but the, one of the first things he did for promotion was to work J. Anthony Brown's club in LA. So Chris couldn't make it. I had the task of telling Jay that after he got a sold out show, Chris couldn't make it, and I thought he was going to hate me. Instead, he called and said, I liked how you handled that. I want you to help manage it. And that's how I got, I started working with Jen now, like for five years. Um, and now I do some bookings and stuff with him. And he, was an, he is an incredible teacher, an incredible friend. And I had to remind him, you knew me when I was in my 20s, because you were with Rashawn and Steve. So I have had some amazing doors open, some amazing uh, shoulders to stand on. And again, comedy welcomed me in. Comedy chose me. I, I didn't chose, choose comedy. 
and then I met a gentleman here named Aldi Freeman, and we became the best of partners and friends. He pulled me on radio, and um, a lady was coming here, he said, you must meet me. And the her was Tina Graham. Now before she came, I researched her, and I was like, oh my God, you didn't tell me that. So she has now become my sister. My uh, big sister in comedy and, and production, like there's nothing she can't do. So whenever I have a clue, I have, don't have a clue on something, I call her. <laughs> Even on social media, she's always, I see her always pressing like and sharing my stuff. And so now I'm here doing my passion project, comedy. It's about female comedians and I have an amazing cast. Cadillac Lily, Amber Neal. Tressa Ellaby, Jennifer Germany, and Keisha Hunt. And you guys stay tuned, it's gonna be amazing. My first, first shooting, and look who I had on set. <laughs> so that's been my journey, it's been nothing but blessings, so. Sound to be. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a part of this. You know, we click from the telephone. Oh, yes. I know. I was doing that competition and it never really happened. <laughs> but we worked hard there. Actually, the competition was fun. Right. And uh, uh, celebrity got to come to New York. They love him. Yes. He got to so, come to New York back. He got to come back. Yeah. Let me know when you want him. He's yeah. ready. He's, He's funny. funny. He'd never been on the plane before. Are you serious? Y'all brought him there. Yeah. That's the first first day. Mm -hmm. First time at Caroline's. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Who does first Caroline's time? the first time? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, tell your story. You got that kind of time? I'm sorry. <laughs> You got 13 more minutes. Uh, 13 minutes? I know it's not going to work, but give me what you can. Not shell. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm born in Jersey, North Carolina raised. My great grandmother raised me. Grew up in the woods, outhouse, you know, the whole nine. Anyway, I got into, I was kind of a loner. So, you know, my, my siblings lived in Jersey, my mother and father lived in Jersey. So. I was kind of a loner because I really didn't want to be in North Carolina. <laughs> so I do things to occupy my time, like listen to gospel songs. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, so music was my muse. My father bought me a radio, and I love that radio. So I would listen to country music. I'm a country person at heart. Oh, wow. Okay. And the only time you heard black people on the radio was Tina Turner in the 70s. Yeah. So you had to sit in the dentist's office and say, why do I know this song? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, about high school, I would sit and watch so much TV. I watched stuff like Star Search and putting on the hits. I'm telling my age right now. Putting on the hits. Putting on the hits was a lip singer song. Right. A lip singer show. They had the Gong Show. Yes. And then they had Star Search. And yeah. they had Rolling Martin laughing. Yes. I remember that one. It was the first time they lived. Because it was sketch That's comedy right. with Carol Burnett and all those guys. You're and right. I would sit and watch Flip Wilson. Anything comedy, and I would watch Johnny Carson. I was oh, like, this yeah. is so funny. I, I love comedy, but I never would have thought that I would be just into comedy. So anyway, I thought I could do everything I saw on TV at school. Okay. okay. The first, my first grade was uh -huh. the first year the school got integrated. Oh, in 1967. Wow. wow. It was the first, my first grade class was the first time they integrated the school. It went from Booker T. Washington wow. to Clark and I. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the 60s, I was. So anyway, by the time I got in ninth grade, I'm like, I came to New Jersey, and they put me in a fashion show. Okay. And I was a straight up tomboy. I'm talking <laughs> sne sneaky with pigtails. And they said, and like, my friend, he was like, I'm going to put you in a fashion show. They made my face and put me in some heels. It was over, huh? <laughs> Diva born. Yes. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? I want to do this at my school. So I did a fashion show at the school, and then I was watching my TV. I'm like, into it, Star Search. I would go to every school in the whole county and get to participate in the talent show. Innovative in ninth, in ninth grade. That's yes, great. I wanted to see everybody. It was, I was fascinated that, that people would actually do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I did a talent show all the way up until I graduated. Every year I did putting on the hits. I got in it. Remember the song Woman to Woman? By who? I, it's the old song, Woman to Woman. Oh, yes. Yeah, the, the ladies talking. Yeah, yeah. I was yes. woman to woman. I had my girlfriend, uh, Gail Paul. I never forget it. She was doing the rebuttal. I was mad because I wanted her part. <laughs> you didn't want to be the one She grabbed me. Uh, she did, it was too funny. Uh, but anyway, I started doing talent shows uh, all the way up until I graduated. 
So when I came to New Jersey, it, I skipped some of the stuff in between, but I came to New Jersey and I was kind of in a bad relationship with myself. But I came to New Jersey and I figured I could do the same thing. I started doing fashion shows. So I was a swimwear lingerie model. Oh, I got a job, uh -huh. you know, and I, I did uh, some college, but I was in a bad situation. So, you know, I just came to Jersey uh -huh. trying to get out of the situation. But I took a job and then um, this came me over for a position. Okay. So they, I had to send me to school, then I got my resignation. So I, know, I, know I started that working I all these odd jobs. I worked at the World Trade Center, I worked at the NBA, I worked at Handover Insurance. I yeah, worked for the UN. I worked at the World Trade Center. Oh, some good. When I got to the little jobs. <laughs> when I got, this is the training that they gave me. This is when they were transitioning into computers. Okay. So I kind of grew with that age. So anyway, I took a job at, at the UN and NBA. And there was this time I'm into comedy now. Okay. How did I that took happen? the fashion shows okay. and I would go to see this comedy and I would use comic relief as part of the act. I went to this place called Terminal D in New, okay. New Jersey, okay. Avenue, and they were doing stand-up comedy in a strip club. Okay. I was really doing stand-up. This is 1988. In the strip and club. I just said, oh my God. Okay. Now, during the 80s, it was all about Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor. Right. You know what I'm saying? Eddie Murphy was Saturday Night Live. Yeah. So I'm like, wow, they're doing stand-up comedy. At this time, I'm managing a bar that had a hall in the back. I was working okay. three jobs. So the, the bartending was my second job. But I was what can't you do? So anyway, <laughs> I'm like, wow. So I came back to that same club mm -hmm. later on, mm -hmm. and it was packed. And all these stand up comments, a comedian named Terry Hodges hosting it, and a guy mm -hmm. named Willie Asbury, God rest his dead. Okay. He was like the only, I had saw him on Showtime at the Apollo. Okay. When they first started doing on it. On your TV show. Yeah, my TV show. <laughs> and he was doing the um, Ronald Reagan mask. That's how far I'm going back. Oh my God. It was like the first comic on there, and he became famous in the neighborhood. Right. So I had him open for the Manhattans at my at the bar. Oh my God. I know we was gonna become best friends later on. Okay. So anyway, this guy named Bob Summer came to my bar. Bob Summer. And he saw me go from the front to the back. And he came there because one of my bartenders invited him. She wasn't paying no attention. So he, came, he saw me go to the back. Uh huh. Because I, I ran the whole bar. So oh. when it was a big audience, okay. a big crowd, right. I ran the bar by myself. I wanted all the money. So, <laughs> so he, he followed me to the back. He started talking. I was like, well, what up, bartender? You're just a drink. Right, exactly. <laughs> Your name is Roman Coke. Right. <laughs> I'm worried about that. Absolutely. You have to stand out to do stand-up. Of course. So now you've got a whole 
social media comedians, sure, everything. You, got, you can beat yeah. a lot of people. And then when Def Jam really hit, now you got so many comics. Ugh. People can actually make a career out of comedy. You talk, back then, you told us about you want to be a comedian, you have to get hired in the post office. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that, that was like, go for it, go for it. Yes, you know? yes, yes. So I started, that's how I started. I got to know so many comics during this time. Uh -huh. Now around, that, this is like 1988, 89, going into that. Uh -huh. Now comedy, everybody's coming to Terminal D and coming to Uptown Comedy Club. That this guy named Cortez guy rest in So many comics that made friends with us has passed away. Uh -huh. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, the comics became my family almost. And so mm -hmm. I started with Showtime at the Apollo. Wow. Who was hosting at that time? Who was hosting at the time? I want to say this is 1992. So it wasn't Steve Harvey. Was it Re Rush yet? No, Re Rush was 18 what, years eight? older at the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's going to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know Moody since he was like 17 years old. He started with, uh, yeah. Oh, wow. They all started at Uptown Comedy Club. But there was nothing like Def Jam. Well, well Def Jam came Def... from Uptown Comedy Club. I get it. Uh, the like Uptown so Comedy Club, me. this is who used to hang there. Okay. Puppy was an intern. Yeah, with Andre Harrell. At Uptown right? Records. With Aldi. With Andre. Andre, uh, Andre Harrell 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 and yeah. Russell were like best friends. Yeah. They all used to hang there, which okay. means that all these hung there. Flax Alexander was yeah. a dancer for Salt and Pepper. Right. Oh, wow. He would come there because he wanted to be a comedian. Every, every Sunday, mm -hmm. they would ask audience members, do you want to be a comedian? Wow. Come up here and tell a joke. They were making comedians. But see, they don't do that any place else. They're all, they, they feel like they And they had workshops all during the week. They, they would sit either. around and, and <laughs> one-up each other. Which, when you one-up each other, you're building jokes. Okay. Right. Everybody wants to be funnier than the next person. So you're going to do your best to be funnier. Yeah. All during, and every Sunday, you had three weeks to be funny. And then you could be like in the, in the, main, in the main show. Wow, so who, who are the people that you could say that you catapulted? Well, during that time, around, mm -hmm. fast forward. Um, you got two minutes left on my SD card. I work with Mike Epp, Tracy Morgan, Flex, Monique, some more. All these guys, you know, they, I had the Peppermint Lounge Comedy Club after a while. Oh, That wow. came in 93. I, had, I went to like four different places for a stand-up comedy just to help you guys get to the next level. <laughs> then I finally landed the job in the Uptown Comedy Club. But Russell got an offer to do a show, uh -huh. which he wanted to do the Uptown Comedy Club right. as that show. Right. So he found out that Bob was moonlighting at the Club 88. Bob ended up getting a job at Def Jam Records. And Bob is part of that. And whole... he knew that Bob knew the Brown Brothers to make that introduction. Networking. Wow. <laughs> oh, he made an introduction. Right. And right. he probably said, don't you let Russell screw me. <laughs> So they made that connection, but right. Russell ended up doing the show anyway. They couldn't come to an agreement on something, but the, the show came from all time comic club. You're watching Behind the Jokes on UHN. Hey! Ah. <laughs>